Hello, everyone, and welcome to Biohackers Lab. I'm your host, Gary Coburn, and on today's show, I've got a cholesterol biohacker. Uh, I have Dave Feldman, and I'm so glad to have Dave on the show because Dave falls into the same boat as me. So let me just give you a little bit of background about him first. Um, Dave is a senior software engineer and entrepreneur based in the US, and Dave's story is that he started a low-carb, high-fat diet, uh, ketogenic-type diet back in 2015, and he did it to to feel better and, and get healthier, and of course, he, he was seeing the results, but like anyone who follows a high-fat-type diet, then he naturally did a blood draw, so he wanted to check what his cholesterol was, and I'm sure anyone who's listening to this who's eaten that way has done the same. I've done it too. But um, what he noticed was that instead of his cholesterol scores getting better, they seemed to have gotten, well, they looked like they maybe got worse. And so that's like anyone who is what's classed as a hyper responder, which we'll talk about soon, uh, got freaked out. And that's why I've got Dave on because since then, Dave got inspired and used his analytical and engineering thinking to delve deeper into the rabbit hole of cholesterol. And I'm so glad to have you on the show today, Dave. Oh, thank you for having me. Sure. So go ahead. No, I was going to say, um, yeah, I, I wanted to maybe start with uh, just the, the concept of hyper-responder, because I've just mentioned it already. So I don't know if you want to start there. Yes, for sure. Um, I, per your introduction, I did start the low-carb diet actually to dodge type 2 diabetes, which is very prevalent on my dad's side of the family. Uh, I got an A1C of 6.1, which is right in the mid-range of somebody who's pre-diabetic. And after doing some reading and researching, I, I found this you know, low carb ketogenic diet and thought, wow, this actually sounds like something I'd like to try. And at that time, even then, I said to a lot of people on the forums, I said, how do I know that I'm not going to just get super high cholesterol and then die of a heart attack? So I said all that I actually did my homework, made sure as best as I could. And for the most part, people were like, well, first of all, there's not a lot of evidence behind that. Secondly, very few people actually turn out to have high cholesterol on a low carb diet. Well, I was further comforted by the fact that uh, shortly after starting, both my sister and my dad got inspired by doing it. Both of them also had health problems that have since been functionally resolved since going on a ketogenic diet. And both of them had their blood drawn before mine. And I said to them then, you know, be prepared for the possibility your cholesterol might go up a little. Uh, because for most people, it either goes up a little, it goes down a little, but only a small fraction, at least I thought it was pretty small at the time, would actually become hyper responders. And given both of them had only a small change, I figured being that I'm so genetically close to them, I would likewise see only a small change. And sure enough, seven months later, and I, as I like to jokingly say, seven months of bliss later, I have this very dark day at the end of November 2015, where I see these whoppingly huge cholesterol scores. And I panicked. I got very concerned. I tried to find everything that I could online. And one of my frustrations was, is I would have thought that given how many people that I saw who were asking about it, that there wouldn't be uh, at least somebody out there who would really take the reins on trying to get to the bottom of this problem. And at a minimum, at least try to you know provide some, some centralized resources for those people who would likewise find themselves to be uh, with these high levels of cholesterol, which is now commonly referred to inside of the low carb community as a hyper responder. And so in a sense, that's kind of what I started to do. In fact, I set out to see if I could get a second test, uh, to see like two weeks later, if it had changed a lot. And in the course in between the, in, in those two weeks, it was a very pivotal two weeks waiting until I did my next test. I started to learn everything I could about cholesterol homeostasis, everything about the lipid system, how it works. I went through a lot of the works of uh, Thomas Dayspring. Uh, I went through a lot of the works of Peter Atia, um, uh, Tara Dahl. These were all kind of considered thought leaders in the space of what's known as lipidology. And that's lipidology is really the lipids that uh, generally focuses on um, cholesterol as itself a lipid but these lipoproteins that carry them around and everything that's associated with it. So 
Then I started discovering this pattern, which I now commonly refer to as the inversion pattern that is very anti-intuitive, which is I've shown over and over again since, since that fateful day at the end of November in 2015, the last year and a half, I've shown that the higher amounts of dietary fat I have, the lower my cholesterol goes within a certain delta, within a certain range. Um, I've also just recently did an experiment where I changed out a certain amount of my dietary fat with carbohydrates just to show that getting a certain amount from carbohydrates would in fact change my status as a hyper responder. And that's still very preliminary, but presumes to be true and does bring around some new exciting findings. Yet all of this, all of this, I really want to emphasize, hasn't actually changed a lot of my core beliefs that have started to solidify since I did the research that actually there's really not a strong correlation between high levels of cholesterol and the buildup of plaque in the arteries known as atherosclerosis. I will say that there's a weak correlation, but I would not say that there's a strong correlation, the kind you would expect with say smoking and all cause mortality, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're going to get onto your experiments in a bit because the, the amount of data you have and your websites with your blogs there, it's just if anyone is a hyper responder or, is, or isn't even a hyper responder, it's so fascinating how you can manipulate your cholesterol scores. Um, but yeah, so because I guess that is the, the thing and it's exactly what you said where that I know it's, I, I can think of it. I had the exact same feeling when I got my, my labs back and I saw the increase in, in cholesterol numbers thinking, oh no, am I doing the right thing here? Because it seems like I'm one of the outliers on the, on the wrong side. And it is, it's a horrible situation to be in where you think, oh, but you've got all these people making praise saying, oh, look at my, my numbers and they're dropping and I'm this and it, uh, you know, everything looks incredible and you're there doing, but I'm, I'm trying to eat as healthy as possible. And I'm, I'm, am I actually doing worse here? Um, and I, I'm in the same boat as you now where I, I've, I've gone down that rabbit hole and I feel, you know, a lot more comfortable, but if we and get a lot it, of what makes it, a lot yeah. of what makes it jarring is I'm sure like, like me, you felt fantastic. You feel great. You see all of these other markers for inflammation, you know, CRP, um, blood pressure, all of these things drop and look fantastic. And then you just have this one thing, the cholesterol numbers that's off on this other end, that's red alert alarming and something uh, virtually every doctor zeroes in on. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like this moment of massive confusion. Like, how could I feel so good? I mean, me personally, I feel better than I ever have in my life while on this diet, including my childhood. I've never felt this good round the clock. And it's a kind of cognitive dissidence where I could say, look, is it really possible that my body would now under this current status poison itself with high levels of cholesterol? Is that really something that's happening right now? And it's, it's a tough one. It's, it's one that I'm, I'm trying to explore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is in medicine. This is still a very gray area, I would say, because, you know, no one's only, even your data is beyond any research studies I've seen out there, you know, just the amount of information you got. Um, and that's why so many, I see so many doctors who follow you on Twitter, you know, love your results because it's so fascinating to see how you're manipulating things. Um, so if you wouldn't mind then you're more on a keto type of diet though versus just a low carb diet because you try to get into nutritional ketosis do you i sh i should emphasize that being in nutritional ketosis isn't uh, as much of a key goal for me i'm really i'm really probably aiming closer to 25 net carbs to 30 and that does end up bringing me generally into uh, ketosis uh, but the actual feeling of being in ketosis is not one that I can detect, uh, as well as many other people who really enjoy being in ketosis. It's more on a therapeutic level that I find I feel the best when I'm around that level of uh, net carbs, um, as far as just general health purposes. When I have experimented, such as this recent experiment where I maintained at 95 grams of carbs for, um, for I want to say about uh, a week, week and a half, something like that. Uh, I had a lot of the carb-related ailments 
that I don't miss, such as uh, the post meal kind of um, droopiness, um, a lot of uh, post prandial uh, high glucose numbers. I don't like seeing those. Um, and yeah, uh, definitely well outside of ketosis, I do constant measurements of my blood um, with beta hydroxybutyrates, which is you know the blood blood based ketone where that you, it, when you're usually trying to measure just how much you're in ketosis, you're usually doing that with like, say a precision extra, which is what I do. Mm -hmm. And, um, again, not that I put a lot of value on that, but I am much more attuned to how I feel in my body, uh, since going on this diet. And I just generally feel better when my carb levels are at least of that level. So I guess what I would say is I'm generally keto in the sense that I land there, uh, but a low carb diet is typically um, typically considered 120 grams of carbs or less um, by a lot inside the ketogen or by a lot inside the low carb community. And you would say that you're low carb as opposed to ketogenic. I'm I'm more low carb. I have played more on the ketogenic side, but um, uh, personally, I found that when I go very keto, I don't it, I actually lose a lot of my appetite, so my weight drops. So in my, in my case, what happened was that I, when I went very heavy keto, so that I tried to eat as much fat as possible, I just, I, I just sort of didn't feel hungry anymore. And so, um, I'm not sure what it is in pounds wise, but for example, I was in, I was consistently about a 92, 94 kilogram weight and I, over eight months, I think it was, I went down to about 79 kilograms, which, so it was a 15 kilogram loss in eight months when I'd never ever been below 88 for I don't know how many years, you know, cause I, I did a lot of weight training. So it just, it's, I, I also learned, I think I actually went into the state where I think I lost some muscle mass. I know I lost muscle mass. Yeah. So it cut that part. Um, I realized in my case for me, I just, I, I had to increase my carb intake in that case or try increase fat. But right then was, I was in that hyper responder state thinking, Oh, you know, if I'm going to eat more fat, am I actually going to, cause more of an issue here too. So I thought I kind of would get the best of both worlds where I'd, I'd maintain a good fat level, but I'd also need to just increase other sources of carbs, but avoid uh, the junk carbs. So then, right. yeah, I, I would, I would likewise say, actually, uh, I had a similar experience in that I was probably closer to 15 net carbs uh, for a while. And same thing, my appetite would fall off almost entirely. And I was getting too low of weight. Um, I was getting under, um, and again, I don't know what the conversions are on the other side, but I was getting below, uh, 170 pounds, which at six, three is like really, really skinny. Mm. Uh, and I'm I, six, three, two actually. So, oh yeah. 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 So, yeah. Um, and yeah, and that's what, yeah. So I would say I'm more on the low carb side of things. Um, so just, could you explain then your, just because you've done so much testing. I mean, what is it now? Uh, when I was reading on your blog, I'm not sure if it's maybe a bit more now, but you've done like 63 blood tests in 18 months. I'm now up to 68. Yeah, 68 blood draws up to this point. So you nearly if, have done a blood draw every week, but nearly, or every yeah, week and a half. half. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's And not only that, a lot of those blood draws, um, I've now had – Let's see, two experiments where I quite literally was getting my blood drawn every single day um, over a week. And I've done, I think, three or four experiments where it was uh, almost every other day uh, in order to um, suss out things on the protocol. For example, the most recent experiment was, I want to say, four tests over 10 days. Yeah. Uh, and the reason... Yeah, sorry. Oh, no. Yeah, the reason is, is because... Um, the LDL cholesterol and HDL cholesterol uh, tends to go on a three-day window. Um, and I say this so often, it's practically a stock speech. If you were to take your blood this morning, and uh, it's a Sunday when we're recording this, then what would matter for your dash C numbers, as in your cholesterol numbers, would be yesterday, Saturday, the day before that, Friday, and the day before that, Thursday. Those three days and the dietary fat you had over those three days would have about, a, by my calculations with everybody who sent their labs in since I started this, about a 30 to 50% relevance to your blood test this morning. 
So if you ate a lot of fat over those last three days, it would be lower than your preference point. If you didn't have a lot of fat, especially if you fasted, because since since posting my fasting experiment, a lot of people have sent this in that they saw the same thing. Your cholesterol would spike. It'd go crazy high. Well, for particle count, for those listeners who uh, at least know the, the difference, that there's also a dash P, as in the total particle counts, uh, counts LDL particles. That's also on a three-day window, but with a two-day gap. So yesterday, Saturday, and yesterday, Friday don't matter hardly at all. But the Thursday, Wednesday, and Tuesday, going back to those three days, that window of time seems to, according to my data, have the most impact and actually is very comparable to the dash C numbers with the last three days. The exact mechanisms behind it, that's what I'm still in the process of discovering. I just know that that's been incredibly consistent for a year and a half, which, which to me as an engineer excites the heck out of me because it means that my body is extremely effective at constantly counterbalancing these numbers. And because it's doing that, I, I feel more comforted that it's actually, um, genius on the part of the, uh, body side as far as the, uh, mechanistic aspect of it. Um, let me actually kind of go into why it could still be a concern because from an engineering perspective, if you were to look at a clock and that clock wasn't giving you the right time, there's two reasons why that clock wouldn't be giving you the right time. One is that the clock is broken. Gears don't work correctly. Something's missing out of it. It doesn't have batteries, right? Another one is that the clock is perf it's functioning perfectly right, but it's set to the wrong time, which we would say is misconfigured. Now, I feel very confident that my lipid system is not broken. The question is, is it set to the wrong time? Is it in fact set too high to where it actually is a, a case for a cause for concern? And then I might, I, I might in fact be bringing about um, a higher risk of atherosclerosis. I can't answer that question as a good scientist. I can't say I know for sure either way, mm -hmm. but most of the things that I've read about the lipid system, lead to the understanding that it is in fact a broken system as to why it is you have high levels of cholesterol, that the body is making a mistake and that that mistake is a systemic breakdown. And I feel that my research is knocking almost all of that part out of the water. Like it's, it's absolutely, um, a good example would be, uh, the clearance theory, which you hear all the time, which is, the reason that there's a buildup of cholesterol is because your cells, and especially your liver, have a difficult time um, pulling them back out of your circulation. And therefore, they hang out for a longer period of time. And the longer they hang out in the blood, the more likely they are to get oxidized, the more likely they are to invade your arterial wall. Well, as I've shown a number of times now with my own research, uh, I can clear particles very quickly. <laughs> That's actually not a problem at all. And I can do it in the way that they would never have predicted, which is by having huge amounts of dietary fat and in particular saturated fat. Uh, my, my extreme cholesterol test uh, from last year, which was the first presentation of my data, I wrapped an experiment around it where I ate 5,000 calories a day. And uh, 461 of those were dietary fat with 740 grams saturated fat per day. It was really hard to do per day. And it made my cholesterol numbers plummet, which I predicted in the course of the presentation I did before having the data back. It's, it, it's absolutely astonishing just how much the body reacts and responds to the amount of dietary fat you're coming in to a predicted level. Like it's not even just a general up or down. It's actually to a range you can really get to a point of predicting. It's amazing. And that's why I wanted to bring up the, the fact that you've done so many blood draws because there would be so many people in this world who, do, who have one test when they go to their local doctor, they yes. get a number and that number determines their health um, management, medical health care management f potentially for a, you know the rest of their life. It's incredible where someone yeah. might go, oh no, it's a bit high, I want to put you on a statin or let's start something and boom, there you go. But that's why I want I love your point saying 
it's yeah you found you have a level but also how much that can fluctuate by what you're doing three days beforehand and people need to be cognizant of that and then that's why we're going to get onto your experiments if someone wants to manipulate it and biohack their cholesterol for let's say insurance premiums then it's possible to do that where you can get you know a, a certain level to make to appease one party whilst you maybe go back afterwards if you wanted to um so let's get into your experiments so you mentioned the first one there where you had is that the feldman protocol what people yes so so this is kind of how that happened i end up doing that first presentation of my data last year and sorry October. was that was that the low was that that's not the breckenridge one that no no that was actually uh the keto gains seminar there's a group out there called keto gains um that's more athletic centric on the ketogenic diet and uh they they invited me as a speaker and i said oh you know and i'm going to go ahead and wrap this big experiment around it where i did this extreme cholesterol drop and it was so popular that people were pinging me like can you tell me how this is done what can i do and I said, okay, I'm, I'm just going to write it up. And I now have it as a page on my blog. It's one of the most visited pages I have. And basically, I, I kind of give it three flavors. The most basic version is that people, uh, like I did, find what their kind of cap, their max point of eating is in dietary fat. Um, they, should, they should stick to whatever the ratio of food is. Um, so, for example, if you're... If on the diet that you're on right now, you have a very standard 5% of your calories from carbs, 20% from protein, 75% from fat, whatever that ratio is, increase that ratio as much as you can for three days in a row. So let's say that you your maintenance level is somewhere around 2,500 calories, and you find you can bring it up to 4,200 calories before you can hardly stand it anymore. Uh, you still want to maintain about that same ratio. Do that for three days in a row. This is the basic version. Do this for three days in a row. Make sure that you fast from the last meal on the last day for about 12 to 14 hours until the blood draw of the next morning. You always want to be sure you do that. Um, they'll they'll tell you to do that anyway for a blood draw, and you should always do that. Yeah, so this would be like 8 p.m. at night, and then you you know 12 hours to the next morning is 8 a.m.? Correct. Yeah. You had, and then when you take your blood draw, uh, you will likely see, given existing data that I have right now, you will very, very likely see a drop in your total cholesterol numbers, your LDLC. And uh, if you're getting an NMR, your LDLP. And your triglycerides typically go down, but your HDLC typically goes up. Basically, all of the markers seem to go in the right direction. So, now, this, so I just want to bring in, so do you think with this protocol, what you're talking about, because you're manipulating your diet for three days before the blood draw, which is what you mentioned. Do you think you, you could do this if you were on a standard diet and then eat this very high fat, high calorie diet for three days and notice a drop? Or is this only, are we talking more just hyper responders in this situation who already have a high cholesterol and they eat this and they eat a much higher diet for three days, and then they notice the drop. I don't know. Thus far, I've had both hyper responders and non hyper responders, yet still those in a low carb diet uh, try this, and across the board, it drops their cholesterol. So yeah, so that's, so that's fascinating. That any it, you don't have to be in this group of the hyper responders, even just if you're in the low correct. carb and you want to manipulate your cholesterol score, use your protocol already. Of correct. The, and I suspect, but it is theoretical, I suspect this will also apply to people on a carb-centric diet. I believe this inversion pattern is across the board. Okay. And I believe so because it makes mechanistic sense, which is once you learn a little bit about lipidology, and I'm going to get a tiny bit technical, but it's worth it to understand this. You find out your LDL particles come in two varieties. There's, there's chylomicrons, which come from the gut, which come from basically food you just ate. So those triglycerides are packages of free fatty acids that you got from food you just ate. They circulate around the bloodstream, and they're actually cleared pretty quickly within a matter of hours, depending on who you read. Uh, the other kind of LDL particle that circulates that energy you get from fat is called VLDLs. 
uh, very low density lipoproteins, and they come from the liver. And those are primarily from storage, from stored fat. So if I'm eating a lot of fat, if I'm showing my body there's an abundance of dietary fat around, then it has reason to lower the amount of fat it brings up from storage. And therefore, those VLDLs go down. But conversely, if I'm not eating a lot of dietary fat, it has a reason to bring up those VLDLs from storage, bringing around more of those triglycerides that I have stored mostly in my adipose tissue. And when you, when you bear that in mind, then the final linchpin is that the cholesterol that's getting measured is the cholesterol found in VLDLs, the LDL particles that already contain the triglycerides primarily from storage. So it makes perfect sense that whatever your body is typically getting from its diet, it's counterbalancing for what it gets from storage. And what's amazing to me as an engineer is it's not doing that on the fly, you know, within like a few hours time. It has this three day window it's looking at, which makes a lot of sense that it's kind of looking at what your survival status is for a large part of the amount of the dietary energy it's mobilizing from fat. It's, it's incredible. It's fantastic. So, yeah. And so we're, we're saying here that basically the fat that you're eating is not the, is not causing fat in your uh, in your blood draws, you know, cholesterol, because that's what people might think cholesterol is fat and that I'm eating fat and it's going into my blood and I'm seeing lots of fat in my blood. But what you're saying here is that that type of fat, when you're eating it, is not the, the one that you're measuring. It's when your body's breaking down its fat cells and it's released and it's going through those chemical processes with VLDLs. And that's what we're measuring here. So people, and that's how, why in your protocol, that you can eat even more fat and your cholesterol score can go down. So it's not that because yes. you've actually taken more by mouth. It's, it's not that there's going to be more in the bloodstream. It's not that relationship. It's, it's completely different. Yes. In fact, mo most people should just absolutely be disabused of the even theory that the amount of cholesterol you're eating ends up in your bloodstream. It's actually a pretty closed system in that regard in that about 85% of the cholesterol that's in our bodies right now, we made. We, we really only get about 15% from the diet. And even then, it's kind of pushed up and down internally back out into our digestive system. Our, our body has a way of getting rid of excess cholesterol via bile acids. Um, that it secretes. And so when it comes down to it, there's actually a very tight level of control of cholesterol that's within the system. The reason it fluctuates so much is because, again, we're kind of capturing one half of what is really an overall energy uh, balancing system. The What makes it exciting is, and the reason I don't feel as concerned about my cholesterol numbers as somebody else with the cholesterol numbers I have, is that I understand that it's mainly a passenger. It's not a driver. So those particles it travels in, those lipoproteins, they're primarily triglycerides. And triglycerides are good when you're on a high-fat diet. Even though your triglycerides go down, it's because your usage is higher. But when you're on a high-fat diet, make no mistake, your cells are getting constantly fed by triglycerides. We hear a lot about ketones. And make no mistake, we get higher levels of ketones too. But I would argue that actually, if you were to break it down to a pie chart, you would find the plurality of your cell's energy on a high-fat, low-carb diet is actually free fatty acids that came in a bundle of triglycerides brought to you in a low-density lipoprotein. And why people need to know this is because that's why it makes sense that there would be so many of them circulating and why that level of cholesterol that's found in it might be higher for those of us who are hyper responders. Now, now, this naturally begs the question, well, then why wouldn't cholesterol go up for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. If everybody's going on a, on a higher fat diet, why don't we see more circulation? And that part, I don't have um, as much of a direct answer for yet, because it turns Turns out that the key is that there's some level of preference associated with how much your body wants to have in patrol. 
But the exciting thing is that I keep finding more evidence that backs up what I like to call the alternative glycogen store theory. Sorry, I may be getting a bit geeky here, but <laughs> basically, here is a pattern that has been emerging that I was kind of predicting, and it seems to be exciting that it seems to be true, which is people who are thinner and more athletic seem to be more likely to be hyper responders. Uh, and in particular, those with very low levels of triglycerides in their blood test and very high levels of uh, LDLC uh, and LDLP, suggesting that they have a lot of those boats that are carrying around those triglycerides, but their their body's pulling a lot of those triglycerides out because it needs it. It needs that amount of energy. There's higher energy demands. Well, because you tend to be leaner and because you tend to have lower glycogen stores relative to somebody who's carb centric, your body has a really good reason to mobilize a lot of energy. If it has a lot of reason to mobilize a lot of energy, has a lot of reason to have more of those LDL particles in play all the time. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. Because that what you're talking about with the sort of the lean hunter gatherer is something I came across. I wish I had the reference, but in this case, it was it was the same thing. Saying you got a hyper responder who's got these high levels, but that I actually think this was um, Dr. William Davies from Wheat Belly, and it was him that was it. He's got it somewhere saying that, um, yeah, exactly. You've got this lean person, uh, but who, who, when you put them on a high fat diet, will have a higher cholesterol number. But they, but then he might already think, no, this person's going to be better at maths. They're going to be more of an endurance runner kind of scenario. There, there's certain traits that follow it, and that's potentially why that they would end up in that, you know, the higher cholesterol numbers situation too. So, um, I, I do I do get what you you're talking about there. Well, in in fact, uh, and I keep trying to point this back out to the community. Now, since starting my blog and kind of becoming a little bit of a de facto source for a lot of people, people are constantly sending me their labs. I see the highest levels of LDLC, the highest levels of LDL cholesterol, along with low levels of triglycerides, where it's under 100. Triglycerides are under 100. Um, uh, LDLC is say 300 or more. 100% of them have been athletes. 100%. I have yet to have somebody who, usually, if somebody's coming from a, a metabolically deranged state, let's say that they're um, uh, originally morbidly obese, they may struggle a while and actually still have high levels of LDLC, but their triglycerides will likewise be high because they still have energy abundance that they're working with, right? What I'm, what I'm seeing is that there's a pattern where you don't actually have energy abundance. You actually have energy demands that are exceeding the energy that you have coming in. Your body, rightfully, from a system standpoint, makes sense, rightfully is trying to compensate for that difference and say, we need to make sure more of this energy is available. We, we need to be at, and particularly in a, a high fat, a low carb, high fat diet where mm -hmm. we, know those glycogen stores aren't going to be topped off as much as they would be for somebody on a carb-centric diet. Uh, it becomes important. It becomes important to say, we need this energy available. And it has, I think, more of a reason to do that. And this is, this is why there's a key distinction between my sister, my dad, and myself. Is When I started a ketogenic diet, I was doing distance running. And they weren't. I wouldn't say that they're totally sedentary. But compared to me, yes. Like, I definitely do a lot more exercise than... They do. And on top of that and becoming as lean as I had, um, I really would have liked to have caught my way on, caught myself on the way down as I had lost like 35 pounds getting to where I'm at now um, to see the comparison. You know, did, was I a hyper responder all the way through? Mm -hmm. And I'd be curious to find out the way that I would test now is that I would have to actually just gain a lot of fat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if I could, if I could gain a lot of fat, I could test that theory as to whether that had an impact on whether I'd be a hyper responder or not, uh, at least to the levels that I'm at right now. Mm. Um, I don't, yeah, that that would be another extreme experiment trying to manipulate your your bot, your adipose yeah. tissue, and then thinking, <laughs> uh, do I go back to that level? And then you know, that's like yo-yo situation. And what are you doing? And how long does it take your metabolism to recover and your hormones to recover after that effect? So. And I don't think I could do it without adding carbs. Uh, I can eat huge amounts of calories while still staying on a ketogenic ratio, while still keeping the uh, carbs at 5% or less. And 
I just have an enormously difficult time gaining weight on it. Yeah. So yeah. I would, I would definitely be concerned at what impact it would have on my health to, uh, just intentionally try to gain a lot of fat. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I'd no, I, I, I'd be. That's why I had to eat more carbs to gain weight. Because if I didn't eat carbs, my, I lost weight. So, right. I, I'd, I'd understand it. And yeah, the dangers that come with why you're having to spike your uh, your insulin your, and your glycemic control, and uh, how that's definitely not healthy either. Um, so, you've got that protocol now um, that I'll link to in the show notes with the Falmer protocol, and that's to quickly drop it. And as you've you've touched on, you've also done fasting where you uh, you've you've fasted and you noticed that skyrocketed your your total huge, flesh. yeah huge jump yeah like the the app in fact I joked that it's the fasting disaster, which actually got got a lot of play. I didn't mean for it to get as much play as it did, but uh, I've also ran across this too. People who seem to be hyper responders, uh, like myself, who uh, a lot of the people who actually reached out to me before said, "Yeah, I tried fasting. I, I couldn't do it for very long." Um, which I'm, I'm curious about how much of a link that there is there. Getting back to the mobilizing energy, when all of a sudden you're telling the body, "Yeah, you you aren't even going to be able to get that much energy from your adipose tissue now because we're cutting off all the food supply." I felt awful on that, but to your point. My LDLC jumped to the highest it had ever been at. I think it was like at 380 or something. My LDLC was at around 380, which would give my cardiologist a heart attack. Yeah, well, just for anyone who doesn't know American numbers, that's about I think when I worked it out about 9.8 millimolar. So it's it's yeah. above nine, and that that would freak anyone in the UK or you know uh, out anywhere else like that. Just thinking nine, but. That's like not even near five. <laughs> yeah. In fact, it's worth emphasizing that that experiment in two days, it jumped up a uh, hundred points. So if it was nine in the UK, that would be changing from like, say a seven to a nine in two days. That's so, just, yeah, that, that there just so to that show you put people the again. nail in the coffin for anybody who thinks that this is not a super dynamic system. I, I I'd read in so many places how you should do this and check back in three months or check back in six months and see how it's going. And, and I'm here to tell you that paradigm needs to crumble and die because whether you believe that what we're doing is high risk or not, at a minimum, you per what you were saying earlier, anybody making a lifelong therapeutic decision off a single annual test, I think is just insanity. This, it needs to end as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't believe in a low carb diet or anything else, you need to understand just how much of your numbers are based on things that have changed in just the last three days. Like it, it, you should, which is why, by the way, virtually any study that's based on cholesterol that did not tightly account for the three day diet of their participants is something I can't pay attention to anymore. And that's almost all of them. And that's because, exactly what I said in the beginning where I don't, I've never seen a research study that's done on its participants, the amount of base level testing as you've done, you know, to know what each person's going to respond to. Yeah. And believe me, had the pattern not emerged going all the way back to the end of 2015, I'd be back to what my life was before this. <laughs> it's, it's the pattern that kept driving me to the next step and to the next step and to all the experiments that I have on my blog is uh, it, it's until more people are doing this, until there's more inertia, inertia, particularly within the lipidology community, not the low carb community, but I reach out to lipidologists every week, sometimes daily. Uh, I've reached out to um, a lot of the, I don't want to call them out, but I've reached out to a lot of the thought leaders that I hope will eventually come around to saying, okay, there clearly needs to be a new level of focus that we need to put on this and what its ramifications are. But at the same time, I know what I'm up against. I'm up against a very large pharmaceutical industry that frankly does benefit from the current paradigm as it stands right now. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of a problem, I think. And have you gone as far then just to also appease your mind, uh, further tests like a calcium, um, 
artery, a coronary artery calcium score or a cross oh, yes. intima, intima, intima media thickness test, you know, with that ultrasound just to actually, so instead of just focusing on lipids, you actually go and check the pipes and, and look what's happening in your pipes, you know, your blood all vessels. Of, all of the above. Yeah. In fact, um, so I've done a CIMT test, uh, the carotid intermedia test, um, three times now, uh, July of last year, November of last year and May of this year. And if you can believe it, um, the May of this year one was the lowest on both the left and right side carotid arteries. Uh, it, my, my thickness actually shrank a tiny bit uh, on both sides. I have had uh, an echo. I've had a stress test. Both of those were in November of last year, I want to say. And most recently, this is how insane I am. I flew to North Shore University hospital. I flew to New York, drove to North Shore University Hospital and got what is arguably the most advanced uh, non-invasive heart scan CT in the world, a 640 slice. And it's really fantastic. The geek in me was, was in heaven because it actually makes a 3D model of your heart. You can actually see your uh, coronary arteries. Uh, um, very... Uh, uh, yeah, coronary arteries and like a lot of the system, it can't get down to like the microvascular level, but it can definitely give probably one of the highest resolution things a cardiologist can look at and cleared it with flying colors. No calcium, no, um, no unusual, uh, levels of, um, of, well, I'd have to have the report in front of me, but they're but basically a whole lot of normal, 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 and unremarkable, yeah. which you want to see <laughs> on one of those tests. And that's the way I like to explain things to people also that um, from what I learned was if cholesterol was a deadly substance, as it's put out to be, it would, it would be dose mediated. So meaning that like it, dosing with anything, let's use morphine, for example, to take away pain, you know, the more you pump in the more dramatic the effect is going to be. So it's a dose response. Cholesterol does not follow that dose response at all. So it, like in this case, being a hyper responder and having high levels of cholesterol doesn't automatically mean that your blood vessels are going to be riddled with atherosclerosis. It just doesn't, have, it doesn't follow that pattern. Correct. In fact, this is where me as an engineer, I, there were some things I immediately noticed were wrong with just the hypothesis alone. And one of them I did in the recent demonstration, eventually I'll post the video online. It, it's kind of a silly video, but I did it to, to prove a point, which is I wanted to get into the mortality of a balloon. So I blew up 100 balloons uh, it, with a pump that pumped at uh, 50 pounds per square inch. I did it until they popped just over and over and over again. It's a pretty funny video. Uh, at some point, I'll have to post it. But I did it because I knew when I did it, if I kept blowing these up and that they pop that there would be a curvature to the mortality of the balloons, which is to say that with each added pound per square inch, the likelihood of the balloon popping increases. Now, this is pretty self-evident when we're talking about air and balloons, right? Mm -hmm. But it's really something that goes to what's known as limited elasticity, which is to say, if I'm going to tell you with a higher concentration of X, the mortality of Y gets greater, then with limited elasticity, that means that there'll be a parabolic curve to the, you know, mortality of Y. Y will just, it's Y will definitely, happen. yeah, it'll happen. In which case, I would expect people with high levels of cholesterol to simply not be alive mm -hmm. into their 70s. Like it just, it wouldn't be possible at all. And in fact, we'd see a curve. So the lower your cholesterol numbers, the more likely you made it to age 90 or 100. And the higher your cholesterol numbers, not only did you not make it to that age, but you, you got exponentially cut shorter to where everybody, say, past the age of 40, just would not have naturally high cholesterol levels of, say, 350. It just wouldn't be, it wouldn't be possible, right? Mm -hmm. unless, unless you're deeper into the curve, and I kind of won't get into that, but the point being is that if they were to say, hey, you're at dangerous levels if your LDLC is at uh, 100. Uh, you, you to be optimal, you need to get like below that, or whatever the number would be. Then I would expect that slowly but surely, as you get to the other side of the graph, everyone dies. Mm -hmm. Well, again, this is self-evident. 
you can look at the existing elderly population, especially before heart medication was introduced, and you could see that you no, know, actually lots of people were wandering around with a full spectrum of cholesterol scores, right? So this is where I kind of want to dial it back a little bit. Here's why I believe that there is a weak association, which I fully acknowledge, a weak association between higher levels of cholesterol and uh, higher levels of cardiovascular disease. And that is because we see that low-density lipoproteins are not strictly about energy distribution, but they are also about reparative events. For example, you'll, you'll see that bodies can upregulate LDL particles in an infectious event. And we found that the reason that that happens is because they actually have an immunological um, advantage and that they bind to pathogens to help clear them, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing with a reparative event, such as if you twist your ankle. Uh, there's a whole number of different um, chemical reactions that occur in the course of damage repair. And one of them is that actually damaged endothelial cells express LDL receptors. They actually call for help from LDL particles. And that's because you find that, in fact, it's probably preferable to having a hole clogged than to have a hole in your, your arterial wall, mm -hmm. right? Which, again, kind of makes engineering sense to me. So when we see something like smoking being the highest risk for cardiovascular disease, yet it has nothing to do with cholesterol. But we see high levels of atherosclerosis, which does have something to do with cholesterol. We have to keep thinking about this from the scene of the crime. The scene of the crime is the arterial wall. What happened there at that arterial wall that makes smoking bad, even though cholesterol might have been low? And it's because smoking, as we already know now, brings around a lot of uh, reactive oxygen species, a lot of free radicals. So you can see weaker dysfunctional uh, cells uh, lining the arterial walls, the endothelial cells, uh, and damaged cells. They can get damaged by free radicals and so forth. Thus, to me, there's no major mystery that we have to find out what it is that makes the vascular system strong or weak. And the weaker a vascular system is going to be, the more damaged or dysfunctional those cells are going to be, the more likely it is that we're going to see atherosclerosis. And that's, that's why the weak association is by itself something that makes more sense to me in that it may be body's response to bringing around higher levels of cholesterol. Mm -hmm. But if, if I can drop the biggest bomb of all, if, you, if the inversion pattern really does apply to virtually everybody, then I'm surprised cholesterol levels aren't higher more often for a healthy reason at the point of death. In that, if people are nearing death, what's the likelihood that their appetite is lower? Yeah, very high. They don't feel like very eating. high. So if the inversion pattern is in play, you would expect that cholesterol levels would be higher in general across the populations, bringing up the uh, the cholesterol numbers while their appetite was lower. Therefore, at least on a temporary level, I would expect it to be uh, I expect it to be significantly higher. Which leads me to believe that actually for all cause mortality being that it's generally a net positive that I almost certainly want to have higher levels of cholesterol. Mm -hmm. mm. That's uh, um, I, I don't know if I've ever seen, has anyone ever looked at, I don't know, have you ever seen someone look at uh, <laughs> total cholesterol scores of a terminal patient, like someone in the last week of their life? Have, has Well, Certainly, there is lots of data that has accumulated because when people are being brought in, because they're about to die, there's often panels that are ran. Now, to, to the degree of those panels being ran that are cholesterol number related, that usually does have to do with the stay. But these are questions. That, but the reason I know this is because I have been quietly asking doctors about this constantly. Because mm. I've been saying, look, I'm curious how much of the data that exists right now that's that's codified in studies is picked up from uh, patients that are near end of life and particularly if they've died within three days of having had a cholesterol score taken because i would be very interested in that information that's and i suspect i suspect that if the inversion pattern is true we would see it generally higher than than cholesterol scores that they had gotten before but 
again, I don't know how easy it would be to get this data because obviously it's confidential yeah. patient information. So uh, I want to get on to your, uh, your biohacking of cholesterol even more with your recent experiment with carbs now. So this is particularly for hyper responders. So people with high um, total cholesterol counts, how they can manipulate it to get some of the lowest um, cholesterol scores they may have ever seen because that's what you did wasn't it yes uh so first major caveat it's extremely preliminary mm -hmm. <laughs> i plan to reproduce it again soon um and i plan to do it with actually an all meat diet uh because i want to take out other possible confounders um and i'll be doing like five days of eating just meat and then five days of um swapping out the number of calories that I got with the meat with um, carbohydrates, I may choose something different than bread because uh, I wasn't excited about doing bread either. I just, I wasn't excited about any version of carbohydrates I was going to bring in. But sure enough, yes, this experiment that we're talking about, I did create, I guess you could say, super stellar lipid numbers. I brought my uh, total cholesterol, which is normally 280, sorry, which is normally around 380 down to 220. And I brought my LDLC, which is normally an average of 270 down to uh, 140. Uh, and my HDL was like 70 to 73. It's really amazing. And my triglycerides were like 43. So if I were to take this to my cardiologist as it stood and just said, hey, look what I did, you know, and I, if it were a drug, you would be like, Let's put that drug on the market so you can make a few billion dollars, right? Because this was uh, but how many days again when you did this? This, Just... this was over uh, five days. So for five <laughs> days, I had a ketogenic shake that was just straight keto. And then immediately following those five days, for five days straight, I swapped out. Um, it was about 3,000 calories per day I was having. And I swapped out 500 of those calories for uh, carbs in the form of just... Uh, whole wheat bread, and the total the total net carbs ended up being around ninety five a day for those five days. And I took a total of three blood tests over that time. I took one immediately after the first day, immediately after the second day, and then finally the last one after the fifth day. And that after the fifth day is the scores that I'm telling you about now. So that that had a huge massive effect on my um, on my cholesterol, my, my lipid numbers. Now really have to emphasize this. The reason this was a bit exciting was because it was showing that there was not a true linear relationship as in the higher I bring my carbs, the better my lipid scores get. And you have to kind of read my post to understand that before that I had done another experiment to kind of prove I was on the other side of that cliff when I brought my carbs up to 78 grams a day and it had no noticeable difference on the inversion pattern that I have mapped. This is kind of an advantage I have that other people don't, that I've done so many of these experiments. I know about when I'm landing where I, where I anticipate I would. And then I know when there's a divergence from what that anticipated level is. Does that make sense? It does. Yes. So the 78 grams of carbs, the inversion pattern still held as in it wouldn't have been any different if I had had 78 grams of carbs or I had uh, 10 grams of carbs the cholesterol numbers still landed about where that would be. Yeah. It's only when I brought it up to 95 grams, and I believe that's because, and I'm kind of calling it the threshold, I believe it's because I crossed the threshold, and I suspect it's probably because I reached a certain amount of glycogen store top-off. Um, there's really a few theories. Uh, Sarah Hallberg would say that it probably was a certain amount of insulin, that for hyper-responders, we may need more insulin to bring down total lipid numbers more and that I was basically inducing more insulin due to bringing in more carbohydrates. That's possible also. Uh, but there are some issues with that one, both on the experiment that I just mentioned, the 78 grams issue. And that when I did my, um, when I did my extreme drop experiment before I did bring my fasting insulin higher than this last experiment. So you would expect that my cholesterol numbers would have been relatively lower. 
against the inversion pattern. Uh, sorry, I know I'm kind of bouncing around here, but you, you get the gist of it. Basically, it's, if people want to try to replicate the experiment that I did before where they just bring in more carbs in order to get a better lipid number, they should know that I'm saying there seems to be a fence. And if you're on the other side of that fence, you won't get the potential benefit of it. If you get on this side of the fence, you might. You might get the p- potential benefit. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, you're saying that if you're on a low-carb diet and you're a hyper-responder, so you've got high numbers, you've got to tear your carbs up, but just know that you might think, oh, I'm already at, say, 70 carbs, um, grams of carbs, and I thought I, that was quite a lot, but still my numbers aren't dropping. But in your with your own N equals 1 physiology, it was at a ni- in the 90s, and then suddenly you notice the drop off. So, but everyone else could be slightly different numbers. Correct. And, and again, I'm still thinking of this mechanistically. It's it's still all theory, but just imagine you have different gas tanks in your car, right? You know, one's one's petroleum, one's diesel, and your car is reacting to how much gas is in each tank, and. That's why to me, it makes sense that my body would be aware that my glycogen stores are topped off at a certain level and it goes, okay, now we don't feel as much of a need to mobilize as much of these LDL particles to carry the triglycerides to be bioavailable for the cells. Now we're satisfied that that tank is full enough that we don't have to bring up this other availability of energy. That's that's my theory behind it. it. the, the bigger point is it's not just simply having higher levels of carbs. And therefore, you'll see this linear shift where as I bring my carbs up, my cholesterol numbers will go down correspondingly. It's more that, no, I need to bring my carbs up to a certain level to activate something. Mm-hmm. And I believe that something that I'm activating is reaching this threshold where the body goes, okay, we're satisfied with that. That's good. and. Again, Occam's razor, I think that's glycogen stores. And it, again, kind of makes this whole general theory make sense even further. Yeah, if that, that's what it is. Yeah. But interesting, as you wrote in your blog post, that even though you made your your, uh, your cholesterol scores look so much better, the uh, there were other factors that weren't so good, like your... Um, your postprandial testing with your glucose. So, right. right. <laughs> so it's, and it's, we come back to that same situation going, oh, look, I've improved my, my cholesterol scores, but hang on, look at these physiological markers. They've gone through, you know, this is unhealthy. You know, this is not ideal. Well, and this is why, this is why a lot of people were confused in that they thought, since I was saying it was a breakthrough, that that was my way of saying, oh, this will now be my new way of life. Mm. Because I was excited for those... And I am excited for those people who are hyper responders who say, look, I hear what you're saying, Dave, and I know that there's a lot of people who think cholesterol doesn't matter, but I just want to have good lipid scores. And I'd love to have an answer for those people because I would like to be able to say, oh, you know what? You can do this and still be low carb. You could, you know, you can still be under 120 grams of carbs, see your lipid numbers improve. And not have to do that through any medication, any supplements, anything. Because at the end of the day, I know that this is all mainly about it being an energy-based system. So it was just a trick in finding what that energy switch was that changed it, right? Mm -hmm. And and if this ends up being that, then I'm excited. But for me personally, actually not a lot's changed. I may have been finding the new switch that does this, but yeah, I felt more tired on days where I had more bread particularly following meals. Uh, my sleep patterns weren't that ideal. And I, I really was not liking my glucose numbers following uh, food. Now, all of that said, my fasting insulin was still relatively good. And it may be that my postprandial glucose numbers would come down over time because I think that a lot of that was boosted by existing glucose sparing that I know my body's doing. Um, and that might be... So it, really, more than anything... It was one of those just listening to my body. What mm-hmm. did I feel better with these better lipid numbers? And I wouldn't say I felt significantly worse. I would just say that I felt not as good enough that I said, oh, this wasn't the switch that makes everything great again. 
Uh, now, all of that said, I probably at some point, maybe in the fall, I'm probably going to experiment with being on this kind of lower carb, but still higher level diet for a while to see if the lipid numbers hold over a long period of time um, and to do a few other things. But I'm actually genuinely not looking forward to it because I just, I know a lot of people will wax philosophic about what it means to be at higher cholesterol numbers, but I genuinely live that. That's like, I, I'm not somebody who researches it and then tells other people who are hyper responders when I'm not, Hey, cholesterol doesn't matter. I really do feel as if I've come across enough information. I'm understanding enough to say, I can't say that I know for sure that it isn't, but I can say that I know enough to know that that's nowhere close to the whole story. Mm -hmm. So for me personally, I'm still on the journey of discovering this as much as I can while still feeling great. And part of doing that is as much as I can staying at the slower ketogenic ratio that I'm at now. Okay. Yeah. And um, that's what biohacking and N equals one is all about. It's a journey. So it's just a self-discovery and then getting to a place that you're happy with when it comes to risk factors. Um, and I think we're, it sounds like we're both in the same boat when, when we're thinking about cardiovascular risk factor and that we've converted from, from putting cholesterol at such um, sort of at the top of the chain, thinking that's got to be the biggest parameter that, that you focus on and actually knock that down and think, no, 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 no. There's other things you've, that are more important than this particular number in this case, you know, and look at other factors. So, no. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So Dave, um, we're coming up on time at the moment, but you've gone through so many knowledge bombs. Uh, I just love it. And again, I, I think as a fellow hyper responder, you know, so I, I also, I'm in the situation where with the high, high numbers that I had, and, um, it is so refreshing to speak to someone like you who has gone so far into with all your testing and just to, sh just to give people that, um, that feeling of it's a, you know, look, this thing is manipulable. Uh, I can manipulate my scores so dramatically. Um, and so don't freak out if you, you know, or if you are freaking out thinking I need to get them down, just know you can get them down. Even if you were a hyper responder because of just even using your protocols and you'll come back down and then, you know, do what you want with your life again. Um, that, so it's just so nice to know that you still are in control. You know, someone listening to this as a hyper responder, you still are in control of your physiology at the end of the day. Yes. Yeah. Um, so how do you, how do people uh, keep in contact with you, you know, follow your work? Oh, well, uh, for sure. Uh, come to my blog, cholesterolcode.com. And uh, probably the best way to reach me is typically on comments on my uh, website. They can also uh, reach me through Twitter, Dave Keto, K-E-T-O. Uh, and those are probably the two best ways to reach me. I also like to visit um, uh, the site done by uh, the two keto dudes, uh, ketogenicforums.com. And they kind of have their own cholesterol area where I'll sometimes also visit as well. But uh, I would say, generally speaking, comments on my blog or through Twitter is probably the best way to reach me. And also, I just want to highlight to people that uh, all this testing is self-funded. So you yeah. <laughs> so I would also recommend you know if you love the listening to Dave and you want it and you and you want him to um to sort of uh, go ahead and do all the testing for you to give you the knowledge then he's got a donate button on his website and please give him a, a donation for all those blood tests because drawing blood is not cheap no. <laughs> <laughs> and especially to the all. degree that you do it's not just a single you know finger prick test and there's your total cholesterol score you're going you're going way more in depth. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, sure. All right. Um, but as you said, you've got more experiments coming and I look forward to hopefully getting you back on the show again in the future where we can uh, delve deeper into those future experiments. Absolutely. And thanks for having me on. Right. All right. Cheers, Dave. See you later.